All right, Braves fans, let's get rolling. I'm George McNair, and this is State of the Braves. Well, guys, the Braves are coming off of a three-game set against the Cleveland Guardians, and remarkably, they remain atop all the National League at 19-7. and seven. And I say remarkably, remarkably just because there have been a lot of major things going against the Braves to start the season. And not that other teams don't have injuries or guys who are performing poorly. Uh, that's kind of true across baseball. It's a truism just generally, you know, uh, across sports and, and certainly baseball. Uh, but the Braves seem to be dealing with these injuries and uh, these performance issues better than most. And I mean, I'm honestly not surprised by that. That has been their MO really for these entire six or seven years that they've had this sustained success with this core group of guys. Uh, but it's not something I want to uh, just, you know, gloss over and not talk about it. It, it really is quite remarkable. Uh, the injuries to Spencer Strider, season-ending UCL uh, surgery. Sean Murphy with his oblique injury. Hopefully he'll be back soon, though we don't know. Those things are really, uh, really finicky. And then Ozzie Albee is very thankfully coming back to the Braves after his frank fractured toe, really back sooner than I expected. And then performance issues from guys that are some of the best players, not only on the Braves, but across all of baseball. Ronald Acuna and Matt Olson and Austin Riley simply have not performed uh, at their level. And, you know, you can look at last year, especially with Olsen and Acuna, and they were playing at such a high level. Maybe it's unfair for us to expect uh, that kind of performance. Um, and yet we kind of do, and, and they, they really are that good. And uh, they just simply have not been yet. And, and I use that word yet. I, we do expect them to turn around. Um, and, and even performance, you know, we could say Max Fried in the starting rotation until, of course, his last start, which was so masterful. And uh, so, you know, I'm optimistic about all these guys. There, there doesn't seem to be anything um, in terms of injury that's, that's keeping them from performing. But baseball is a hard game, and every, every player, not, doesn't matter, it does not matter how good they are, can go into these, these things. One little thing can go wrong. It can throw you off then you kind of fix it and everything goes right. And of course, the mental side of the game as well. But, but yeah, all this, the, these performance issues and, and uh, injuries, and yet the Braves are still 19-7 and seven with the best record in the National League. And, and the Phillies are playing good, and even the Mets are playing pretty, pretty good, and yet the Braves, uh, with all these things going on, it has to be infuriating if you're a Phillies fan or a Mets fan because the Braves are still at the top with all these different things uh, going kind of in a negative direction for them off the field. Uh, so don't get spoiled Braves fans. You know, I think it's, uh, it probably happened to, uh, to us in the past. I mean, in the nineties, I think I was a part of that. You, you just get so used to winning and you just almost take it for granted. And then, you know, all the, the, the fans kind of stop coming out to the games and that sort of thing. I don't expect that to happen. Uh, now it's a different era of Braves baseball, but it's just a reminder, like let's not get spoiled with uh, the success of this team. Uh, you know, I did want to mention really quickly about Spencer Strider. I don't think I mentioned mentioned it since the, uh, it's been a couple weeks now, but since the news came out about his UCL surgery, it was a little unique. If you have not heard this news, uh, so Strider, he did not tear his UCL. It wasn't normal uh, tear or damage to the UCL that most uh, pitchers seem to have. Now, obviously, I don't know more than what has just been reported on the surface, but I wanted to mention that it was a bone fragment that was in his UCL that required obviously to be removed. Probably if you didn't remove it, it could have created a lot more damage. Uh, it was um, causing him some weakness in that arm. And so obviously they had to get it out. Uh, and I, they also performed that brace procedure on his ligament. So I kind of assume they performed that uh, maybe they had to damage UCL in a little bit of a way, you know, to get that bone fragment out. Who knows? But I think the brace surgery is probably going to be an additional benefit to him. It, you know, it will just further strengthen that ligament moving forward. So it doesn't mean he couldn't still have an injury down the road, but I think it does uh, provide a little more uh, positivity about uh, the health of Strider's arm generally and um, the fact that maybe he can come back uh, for the start of next season, which is a big benefit because look, potentially losing Freed and Morton, you know, we keep mentioning that 
potential. Uh, having Strider at the beginning of next season is actually incredibly important for the Braves. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and go into a recap of this most recent series the Braves had with the Guardians. And then I'm going to look back and just kind of give you some of my thoughts about what's happening with the Braves, uh, not just in this last series, but kind of across the last week or so. Uh, so the Braves came into this series. It's a showdown of teams with the two best records in baseball. The Braves, the best in the National League. The Guardians, the best in the American League. Uh, Guardians, surprisingly, um, they've always had a good pitching staff, but they struggled to score last year. They've been a lot better offensively this, this year. Uh, the Braves came into this series uh, coming off two other series wins. They had taken two out of three against the world champion uh, Texas Rangers, and then they swept the Marlins in what was mostly a lopsided series, actually shut out the Marlins twice before they had to uh, win in extra innings against the Marlins in the last game of that series. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's kind of focus in on the Guardian series uh, first. Uh, so game one, the Braves took this game uh, six to two behind seven strong innings from Chris Sale. This was really great. It was probably his best start as a Brave to this point. He only allowed one earned run in those seven innings and only two hits along with six strikeouts. And, you know, if you're watching this game, it was just like he found a groove, he found a rhythm, and he just kind of dominated from that point on. Ozzy uh, picked up two hits. In his return off of the IL, again, it just looks like he hadn't missed a beat, which is great. And Arcia went deep in this game as well. Offensively, the Braves scored six runs. It's not like there was one or two key kind of stars of the show. There was um, most most of the guys got a hit or, you know, just kind of uh, contributed in uh, one one way here or there. Uh, Ozuna had two RBIs on a, on a hit. Uh, but yeah, it was great to see Ozzy back on the field. And again, Sale really dominated in this one. Game two, uh, unfortunately, was a loss uh, in an extra innings loss to the Guardians. And honestly, you know, I hate to say it, to, you know, but coaching mistakes and a uh, lack of timely hitting really contributed to this loss. Uh, four to two in extras. Charlie Morton, uh, you know, he pitched great. Seven innings. Uh, his best start of the year as well. Seven scoreless innings. His fastball, curveball, and changeup were all working. Um, but the offense was silenced by Tanner Bybee, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, sorry if I got that one wrong. Uh, Cleveland's first two runs. This was one of those kind of annoying games that baseball can produce sometimes. Uh, annoying losses, I mean. Uh, Cleveland's first two runs were scored in the eighth inning without them ever getting the ball out of the infield. It was just a confluence of some weird, uh, weird hits and, and things like that. Um, and so the Braves go down to nothing. They're able to bounce back in the bottom of the eighth. Uh, but really it, it was in the eighth inning that I think there were a couple of really questionable coaching decisions. Snicker pinch ran for Travis Darno, uh, with, uh, with Williams, who is their backup, uh, uh, backup infielder, you know, he, um, he got thrown out at home, uh, after a, uh, a bloop single, uh, by Jared Kelnick. Uh, it was a poor decision to send him home. Uh, you know, it's one of those where the runner had to kind of hold up for a minute and then go. Uh, but the decision by Snicker to pinch run for Darno in that situation, I didn't like it in the moment. I promise you, it's not one of those that I'm looking back now and saying it was a bad decision. In the moment, and, and Snicker has done this actually multiple times already this year. Uh, there's a catcher on, it's late in the game, and he pinch runs for him. And the reason I didn't like that is, you know, basically how it played out. If the game remains remains tied, um, then you take Darno out of the game. And that's more important now because, as you guys know, Darno has been one of the hottest Braves hitters uh, in the lineup. And it really did come back to bite the Braves. Uh, the game remained tied. Uh, it goes into extra innings. Uh, Trump comes up, the backup catcher, if you don't know who Trump is, comes up uh, in the 10th with one out in the bases loaded. And wouldn't we all love Travis Darno to come up in that situation? Uh, but it was Trump instead. He strikes out with the bases loaded. And uh, then Kelnick also couldn't come through. I mean, it's not just, it's not just on the coaches. You know, Michael Harris came up Early in that inning, bases loaded, nobody out, swings first pitch, bounce it back to the pitcher. 
so, you know, it's on the field as well. And, and I'm sure that uh, Harris would, would admit that and probably take, take some of the blame for that situational hitting. But uh, I just really, I wanted to bring it up because Snicker has done it multiple times and I always hate when he does it. Simply because Darno, yeah, he's he's a slower runner. If he's on second base and you have a hard single to the outfield, he might not score on that. But he's a smart base runner, and you don't know what's going to happen with with the Braves, right? You might get a double, and he he can just walk walk home basically, uh, or somebody launches a home run, or um, you know some line drives. Even a fast runner is not going to make it home. Uh, so I just in that situation especially, I didn't like. Uh, the call and it really did come back to bite the Braves in game two. So, anyways, they do drop that one four to two in extras. Uh, but game three today, Sunday, uh, the Braves were thankfully able to take this one in extra innings four to three. Uh, the Braves got a less sharp performance from Bryce Elder. Uh, it did end up being enough. He goes five and a third innings, uh, only gave up two earned runs. Uh, you know, so certainly to his credit. Um, he was able to avoid the big inning. He really wasn't hit hard, but he was kind of all over the place with his command. Had one inning where they scored, uh, the Guardians scored multiple wild pitches. I mean, it was just kind of crazy. He just totally lost, uh, lost some like multiple pitches in that inning, but again, was able to get out of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, the bullpen comes in. Bummer did allow one, uh, one run after that. Uh, but, by the way, Bummer, you know, I keep hearing from a lot of Braves analysts, Bummer's got great stuff. Bummer's going to be okay. Well, he hasn't really been okay yet. He's leaving a lot, I think, especially of his off-speed pitches in the zone, and it's making him very hittable, giving up a lot of hits uh, to this point. So, yeah, hopefully he can lock in, but he hasn't really been very good lately, and what's well, otherwise been a pretty good bullpen for the Braves. Um, so those are the three runs the Braves allowed. Um, Ronald and Austin and Olsen did come to life late in this game. Uh, I'm going to get to their struggles a little bit later in this episode, but they did come through late in this one, each of them getting a, a hit late uh, and contributing. Uh, Ozzy also getting a big hit uh, late as well. And the Braves end up winning this game in 10 innings. Uh, I think they're now 4-1 and one in, in uh, extra inning games this year, which is awesome. Uh, Olsen got a bloop single to tie the game, uh, and then they had a great inning from A.J. Minter. He came in, uh, shut the door, uh, picked off a guy at second base um, in the middle of that, which was really big, and then Riley uh, in the 10th is able to get a soft line drive up the middle to win it. Super happy for Austin, who's, I think, um, you know, he's been struggling, but he's also had some really bad breaks lately where he does hit the ball hard and hasn't had anything to show for it. And so just for him, for him mentally to get a game winner, maybe it will really unlock it uh, for him. All right. So guys, that's, that's the last three games. The Braves win the series against the guardians who again, have been playing really good baseball as well. So really encouraging. Um, let's go into a couple things that I've seen going on over the last week or so generally for the Braves. Number one is the Braves starting pitching has really stepped up big over the last week. Uh, you know, as a whole, this has been the best week long stretch for the Braves starting rotation thus far. And it's one of those things that kind of opens your eyes. If they can do this or anything close to this for the remainder of the season, the Braves, um, <laughs> their, their ceiling is raised much higher. So the first, and it kind of started with Bryce Elder. He returns from AAA. He pitches six and two-thirds scoreless innings in his return. You know, it had to be really frustrating for him to have to start back at AAA this year. I'm sure he had to fight some of those feelings of, like, I don't deserve this. I should be in the, in the starting rotation. But he also probably had to be really, um, really honest with himself of how bad he was in the second half last year. All that to, to be said, a lot of credit here. He comes back and pitches really well in his return. He wasn't dominant, but, you know, Bryce Elder is probably almost never dominant. Uh, he's not a strikeout guy. It's, it's a reminder of who he is and, and how he got through these scoreless innings. He'll allow some hits. He'll allow some base runners, but he also gets out of a lot of jams because he gets a lot of ground balls and a lot of double plays. And uh, that's a little bit of a tightrope to walk. It doesn't always work out, 
but it did in this one. He got out of trouble um, a lot. And the other thing that it is a reminder of is, you know, he didn't really walk many guys in this one, but when he, when he walks more guys and he gives up these hits, that's when he allows multiple runs in an inning. And it's why it's so important for him to stay in the zone and uh, limit, limit the walks. All right, then Freed, right? Freed had his Maddox. Everybody keeps calling it his Maddox, his complete game shutout and um, pitching under 100 pitches, which is so rare in today's game. And it it just is a reminder of what it, <laughs> how the game used to be, uh, but also, man, how hard it is to do that these days. Uh, and it felt like Max really needed this type of a game. It I think it provides a big boost mentally to the team when the guy who's supposed to be and kind of has to be your ace now that Strider's out goes out and shuts a team down to this level. I mean, Freed just dominated the Marlins from the start in this one. Um, you know, Freed has been less sharp uh, to begin the season. It's just like none of his pitches are going quite where he wants. Um, he's missing his spot a lot. Uh, guys are fouling balls off a lot. Well, none of that was really the case in this one he brought his a plus stuff against the marlins and man what a performance it was the rare complete game shutout nine innings pitch no earned runs three hits uh no walks six strikeouts and 92 pitches and you know six strikeouts doesn't sound dominant but what freed said after the game is so true and i think so key of him he's not a 10 to 12 strikeout guy and i think early in the season it looked like he was kind of shying away from contact. And in this one, he was welcoming contact and he was much more aggressive and aggressive in the zone and just off the plate. He looked a lot looser and yeah, it was a lot of contact. It was a lot of early weak contact and a couple of ground balls as well and uh, double plays. And that's who Freed is and that's how he can be dominant. Five to six strikeouts a game. Uh, but a lot of early and weak contact. And that's why the, the pitch count was so low. So that it really is the, um, the equation for Freed to be effective and to be consistently dominant is to do that. And, you know, it might not always go quite that well. Uh, the Marlins, of course, are a weaker offensive team, but uh, we know that Freed can, can do that. And, um, and hopefully this has unlocked a little something, maybe reminded him of, oh yeah, this is the way I've got to go about things. His stuff might not always be as sharp every game as it was that night, but it is the way that he has to uh, to operate. Uh, Ronaldo Lopez, guys, his early dominance continues. And my just big question is, can he sustain it? Um, you know, Lopez uh, does, does his thing. He gets through seven innings this time. He'd been six innings in each of his last three starts, uh, and he goes seven innings in his fourth start. One run, three hit ball, and he now has a microscopic 0.72 ERA. His ERA actually went up after this start, um, but 0.72. Yeah, no one can sustain this level of dominance the entire season. His, his ERA is not going to stay below one, but can he sustain the workload uh, that he is doing for a full season? Of course, coming back from being a relief pitcher the last several years, um, I'm sure the Braves are fully aware of maybe trying to reduce his innings pitched, maybe below 150. I don't know if they have a certain number in their minds. Um, but, you know, we don't know. Uh, you know, Lopez, he's a he's a pretty big dude, and I like how he's pitching in that he's not going 100%, right? Uh, he has 98, 99 miles an hour in the tank, and every now and then you'll see him do that. Uh, in rare back. And that's really how I think the old school pitchers like Smoltz would do it. Uh, and he's talked about that. So I like how he's doing it. He's pitching more at 95 miles an hour uh, with a wipeout slider. And then every now and then rearing back and hitting 97 or 98. Um, and so, yeah, I think he's going to be able to be okay and, and uh, maintain it. Uh, but the Braves certainly are going to have to be thoughtful about how often they use him in this first season back. Uh, from, you know, from bullpen now back into the starting rotation. All right. And then Chris Sale and Charlie Morton, you kind of pair them together. These older guys in the rotation, uh, they, their early reliability has been really huge for the Braves and their last uh, starts as well have been really awesome. I've already mentioned Sale's start 
was really good. Seven innings pitch, one earned run. Uh, he he allowed another leadoff homer, which I think he's allowed three leadoff homers um, in his early starts. It's a really weird stat. Um, but it's like after he gets that leadoff homer out of the way, he's good to go after that. He only allowed one more hit after Stephen Kwan's leadoff homer. One walk, six strikeouts, and he was just looking very comfortable and in great rhythm in this one. And maybe, you know, we're kind of, as Braves fans, getting to know Chris Sale, but maybe that's kind of his thing. Like, once he gets that rhythm going, uh, just let him let him fire him between the, the fastball and the slider and the occasional changeup. He's got some great stuff working. Uh, and then Charlie Morton, again, also mentioned him, but seven innings pitch, no earned runs, four hits, six strikeouts in his last start. Unfortunately, it was a Braves loss, but that has nothing to do with him. I mean, uh, all of his pitching pitches were working that night. And, um, you know, his fastball especially, and I've always said this, I think the most important pitch for, for Morton is his fastball and his command of it and, you know, dotting some, some corners with it um, because, of course, his curveball is his best pitch, right? But I think his fastball is his most important. And oftentimes he can, if he's able to spot it, he can get some strikeouts because everybody's looking for that curveball. Um, and man, he was really good with this. And, and uh, you don't typically see a lot of really good changeups from Morton, but he threw that one as well. So man, hopefully he can continue that as well. But overall, the Braves pitching staff has just looked so good over the last week. We're going to see Ronaldo Lopez again here soon, uh, as, uh, as elder just pitched, but overall the Braves now have the ninth best ERA in baseball. I think it was up. It was definitely middle of the road, maybe a little below, um, like like 18th or something like that in baseball. So it's now just the ninth best ERA in baseball, which honestly, if it just stays there, you feel pretty good as a Braves fan. I think overall, I bet it will, if everybody stays healthy, I think it will actually improve from that point, uh, but it's really encouraging. And of course, that, that number is starters and bullpen um, combined. But yeah, over the last 12 games, the Braves have only allowed 30 runs. You know, and that includes teams like the Rangers and the Astros. And of course, Cleveland, who's been playing really good. And yeah, the Marlins are in there too. But yeah, 30 runs in 12 games. You do the, the easy math there, 2.5 runs per game for the Braves. They're going to win a lot of games if they continue to do that. All right, I mentioned this one as well. Ozzy returning is huge. Just the fact that he only spent 10 days on the IL. You know, when anybody goes down with, you know, you're talking about a fractured toe, you're thinking, I really thought it was, you know, three, four weeks on the IL, and yet he comes back in just 10 games. I really don't know how that's possible, but he feels good and is moving good, and maybe it's in a spot that doesn't really bother him that much. Um, and he comes back and doesn't miss a beat. He's had hits in um, each of his three games coming back. Um, actually is five for 13 with three doubles and two RBIs in the three games back. And his presence really matters. You know, obviously his performance matters. He's going to be much better than Guillaume or, or David Fletcher, uh, but his presence matters too. You know, he, he sets a tone of, uh, you know, yeah, he has fun, but it's not a, it's not a goofball kind of fun. It's uh it's a lightheartedness, but also he does his job and he plays hard and he hustles and all those good things that Ozzy brings. So really good to have Ozzy back for sure. Um, and then, of course, I want to mention Travis Darno. I haven't been able to talk about Darno yet, guys, but he went off against the Rangers. And if you were watching his three run, his three homer game, it was so fun to watch. He Travis has a historic series against the Rangers and actually I think one one game against the Marlins as well but he hits five homers over the course of just eight at bats including uh, the second three homer game of his career and that's what makes it especially historic he becomes just the third catcher in baseball history with two three homer games joining Hall of Famers Johnny Bench and Gary Carter who also did it you know, we know this, but it's just a reminder. Travis Darno is at his best. He is an elite offensive catcher and he's a pretty darn good defensive catcher too. And, and the Braves have leaned on him a lot with, with Murphy 
uh, on the IL and will probably continue to be on it for a little bit longer. Uh, Travis was not hitting well before this three home run game, but it's really seemed to spark him. Something snapped or something clicked. And, um, you know, Tra Travis didn't have a great 2023 either. And so, you know, I don't know what was going on there. I always kind of assumed there was some kind of injury, but, but he didn't start, start off great this year either, but maybe it's just a swing adjustment or maybe it's just who knows what, uh, but man, he's hitting great right now. And hopefully it continues. Now I had just been thinking literally that night, it was running through my head before all this happened that Travis's swing just had looked off. Uh, for a while, right? In 2021 and 2022, Travis was a great hitter, uh, more powerful. Of course, in 2022, he was an all-star. Um, and he had always had that two-hand follow-through, just that powerful swing, two-hand follow-through swing. And often last year and early this year, he kept finishing like this high one-handed swing. And it just looked off and a little odd, like it wasn't his true swing for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know why that was going on. I don't even know if it's connected to his success, but you notice in all of his home runs, it's been back to that two hand powerful swing, uh, that can actually generate some like serious, serious real power. Um, so that game against the Rangers, you know, his three home run game, it's just like he found his old swing again. And all three home runs were totally annihilated. Uh, his first one, uh, off of a fastball went 429 feet. Uh, his second one off of an off-speed pitch, I think it was a slider, went 440. And then his third one, which of course was a grand slam that broke the game open, uh, went 433. And I think it was like 109 off the bat. Uh, so Travis can do that, right? He can generate significant power. And it was just awesome to see that three-homer game. But of course, he followed it up in his next few at-bats. He hit two more home runs. Uh, and just so you know, he entered that first game against the Rangers hitting 220, no home runs. And now he has raised his batting average to 305. Of course, five home runs on the season and is just playing great. So it highlights again, not to go back to the negative, but highlights again how kind of annoyed I was in the moment that Snit took out Travis um, for, you know, pinch running purposes. Because uh, you know you want him in your in the game right now. He's one of your best hitters. He's one of the hottest hitters in all baseball. Why would you take him out of the game? But man, uh, he has obviously been awesome, and everybody loves Travis in the in the clubhouse. And it's really cool to see him having some some success. All right, so I want to finish out this episode talking a little about a little bit about Riley and Olson and Ronald and how they've been struggling a little bit and just aren't quite there yet. And, uh, you know, all three, you know, when I'm looking at their swings, obviously they have different swings and, and some different things that they're doing. And I'm not going to pretend that I know every intricacy of their swings, but generally speaking, it looks like they're all a little early uh, on their swings. And especially Ronald and Olsen look like their hips are flying open. You know, they're way early on a lot of uh, off-speed pitches and they're not covering fastballs uh, away. Right. And that's just the telltale sign that you're early, you're, you're coming off the ball, right? You're flying open too much. Uh, when all three of these guys are going well, they're hitting the ball with serious authority up the middle and to uh, the opposite field. And they just haven't been doing that. And, I, and with authority is the key, right? They might still occasionally get a soft single the other way, but they're not hitting it with authority the other way. Uh, it may sound simplistic to just say you need to hit the ball the other way. We hear that all the time. But, you know, I go back to what Chipper Jones always says. He says, let the ball travel. You want to get jammed uh, every now and then. It's a good sign that you're letting the ball travel and you're going to hit the ball with more authority when you do that. And they really need to get back to that, right? And so a lot of balls off the end of the bat uh, where they're just, you know, swinging early uh, and pulling off the ball. I will say Austin Riley has looked a little bit better lately. He had a good game uh, to, today against Sunday, the game winner, of course. But he also had a hit the other way early in the game. And he, in the last two games of that series, he had two near-miss home runs. He just got under it. The wind was blowing in from left field in the last two games. And I think he probably squeaks out both of those home runs if the wind 
wasn't blowing, you know, maybe they're, uh, they're in the first row, but again, you know, Austin Riley, when he's going well, he's hitting 450 foot bombs. It's not, you know, just clipping the first row. So no, I don't think he's quite there, but I, I do think there's some good signs for him. He did hit three balls over hundred miles an hour in Saturday's game, even though he went hitless in that game. So again, for him, I think it's a combination of some bad luck and he's just not quite right. Um, but all three of them have definitely been playing below um, what I'm sure they expect from themselves. Uh, one easy measure to look at um, when we're talking about offense production is uh, weighted runs created plus. Uh, you can look at that number. Of course, you can dive into all the numbers on fan graphs if you want, but it's just an easy way for us to talk about it on this podcast. So if you don't know this, this measure, 100 is league average. Um, so let's go through all three of these guys and then I'll break, break down a few more numbers for you. So Riley right now, again, a hundred is league average. These guys are, you know, top 10 players in the national league. Um, Riley last year, uh, his W his WRC plus was 127 this year. So far it's 90, uh, Olson, um, his, his, uh, WRC plus was 160 in 2023, it's down to 103 this year. And then Ronald Acuna was, again, otherworldly, 170 one runs, uh, weighted runs created plus this year, 115. So again, 115 is not terrible, for, but for Ronald Acuna, who is the best player on the planet, um, yeah, 115 is definitely below what he really should be doing. So Let's start with Austin Riley. Uh, let's break this down a little bit more. Riley is hitting about the same hard hit percentage um, and hitting it the other way and up the middle just about as much as usual. Uh, but again, not, not as much with authority the other way. His barrel rate, strikeout rate, and walk rate are all slightly worse than they were last year, but not by a lot. Um, so this is why I think he just seems a tick off all the time. Like he's not barreling the ball uh, you know, again, the numbers say he is, but it just like it's, he's not quite catching it quite right. Um, you know, a lot of his balls that he's hitting, they're just foul. Uh, he's definitely hit a couple home runs foul down the line. Or he's just getting under the ball like these two home runs that, you know, that weren't home runs. They end up being, you know, warning track outs. Um, so he's just not quite squaring up the ball. Um, so it's a little hard to break him down, but Olsen and, and Ronald is, it seems pretty obvious. So Matt Olsen, his barrel percentage is way down. It was at 16.4% last year. Now it's at 11.8%. His strikeout rate is a bit up while he's hitting more grounders and line drives than he did last year. Last year, he was a fly ball home run hitting machine, uh, hitting the ball hard in the air equals home run. <laughs> okay. So last year he, uh, he actually was pulling the ball only at 38% of the time. Um, then obviously the rest of the time, 62% of the time he was going to center field or right field. That's what we want for Matt Olson. This year he's pulling the ball way more 57% of the time Matt Olson is pulling the ball and he's going to center field and right field only 43% of the time. So that is a huge difference for Olsen. Again, he's out front a lot and his swing looks different because of it. And then Ronald, let's talk about him a little bit. His walk rate is up, uh, but so is his strikeout rate. And this is a big one for me. So um, his strikeout rate is back to his career levels. And if you know anything about how awesome Ronald was last year, he kind of miraculously cut his strikeout rate in half, which is almost un unheard of. Uh, he went from a career 23% strikeout rate to 11% last year, which again, is just crazy. 11% for a guy who hits 41 home runs is, is crazy. So the fact that it's back up to 22, 23% is a little concerning to me. Um, he has only barreled the ball 7% of the time, which is telling you right there, his swing is just off. Okay. Um, that is absurdly low. For him, last season, he was barreling, barreling the ball at 15%, and so now it's down to 7%. He also has an extreme ground ball rate. He's hitting the ball on the ground 55% of the time. People were complaining last year that he was hitting the ball on the ground too much, which was about 49% uh, of the time. Uh, so it's up from even that. 
and he has a much higher pop out rate uh, this year. So, you know, when you're hitting a lot of ground balls and popping the ball up, you're not doing damage. And that's kind of what Ronald has been doing a lot of his pull rate is also about 10% higher than last year. And so to me, I think that again is the, the root of the problem for Ronald, uh, his hip. I've noticed this a lot more recently. His hip is flying open a lot more. I've seen him hit the ball to center field multiple times where um, his, his top hand's coming off the bat and he's following through. And I think that's a sign that he's just getting way out in front of the ball and he just doesn't have the power that he typically would when he stays inside the baseball. Um, so you look, his last at bat in today's game, Sunday's game was really encouraging. He smoked a line drive up the middle. Um, and simply doing that, it was like, yes, that is Ronald's swing. I just haven't seen it much lately. So yeah, do that, <laughs> Ronald, do that. Um, look, he's too good for this to continue much longer, but it is the mental side of the game where you're struggling. I'm sure he's frustrated feeling like I'm the MVP. I should be playing at such a higher, higher level. I only have one home run. I should be hitting more, you know, and it starts feeding in and he just has to settle down. All three of these guys have to settle down and just play the game and let, let it come to them. And it's way easier to say that than for these guys to actually do it. Um, the struggle that these guys are going through, is just a reminder to all of us how hard baseball is. Cause again, these are three of the top players in all of baseball, but everybody in baseball experiences slumps and failure and having to pull themselves out of that failure. And, you know, it's one of the things I like about baseball. It's, it's, it's a hard game. And the nature of baseball is that the frustration can wear on you. You play every day, you keep going over for four, you keep not hitting home runs or, or not squaring the ball up. It really festers and it can build, but hopefully these guys are all starting to come out of it again, a, an encouraging game Sunday against the guardians for all three of them. So I don't want to celebrate too much, um, with today's game, uh, but it is a positive, um, and all three of these guys contributed. Uh, but yeah, it is just a reminder that the team is going to be offensively unstoppable once these three guys get going. And I cannot wait for all three of them to get going all at the same time. And it's going to be, you know, a, a bunch of 15 to five wins if, if that happens. All right, guys. So let's just quickly preview the next couple of series for the Braves. Next up, the Braves travel to Seattle to take on the Mariners in a three game series against a very deep Mariners pitching staff. They are leading the American league West right now. I think they're like 15 and 12. Um, so they haven't been blowing people's doors off. They don't have much of an offense, but their, their pitching is legit. Uh, so if the Braves can score against them and these three guys especially can break out, then, um, that's going to be, uh, impressive to say the least. And then after a day off after Seattle, the Braves will go to Chavez Ravine and, uh, take on the Dodgers, a showdown of Dodgers and Braves. Everybody's going to be assuming these are the two best teams in the national league. So that's a really exciting series. And again, hopefully Ronald and Austin and, and Matt Olson can be fully locked in by the time they get to LA, uh, to, to match up against their big three and, and their starting pitching has been pretty darn good to start the year. Um, but they're still, they also still have some pitching issues and injuries as well. Uh, the Braves are not the type of team to walk into LA feeling like they need to make a statement or, you know, put too much pressure on themselves, but just as a Braves fan, it sure would be great to at least win that series against the Dodgers. But, uh, that'll obviously be a fun one. So a West coast road trip coming up for the Braves. Um, and yeah, looking forward to it. So guys, look, thanks for tuning in to another episode of say the Braves. I'll talk to you soon.